Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 25th, 2011, and my guest is Deborah Satz, the Marta Sutton Weeks Professor of Ethics and Society in the Department of Philosophy at Stanford University. She is the author of Why Some Things Should Not Be for Sale, The Moral Limits of the Market. Deborah, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me. Now, your book on the moral limits of markets is very provocative in the best sense of the word for this economist. You start the book by criticizing the sterility of how markets are viewed by modern economists relative to classical economists, Smith, Ricardo, Marx. What do you think is wrong with how modern economists look at markets? Um, so I have a, a number of um, places where I think that the modern view has lost <clears throat> some of the insights of the earlier view. And the first thing is that modern economists tend to treat, this isn't completely true, but tend to treat all markets as the same. So they're more interested in the quantitative properties of markets, the equations that you can use to write down the supply and demand curves, and less interested in the qualitative dimensions of markets. And I think that's a mistake because I think in the abstract, you're losing some information that you need about particular markets. And so I, in my book, explore the qualitative dimensions of markets that people respond to intuitively. So intuitively, people have very different reactions to markets in body parts than they do to markets in automobiles. Yeah. Even though all of these things can be represented by the same set of equations, um, there's an intuitive um, disgust um, or abhorrence to certain kinds of market transactions. And what I'm interested in is seeing what in the concrete, in particular heterogeneous markets, what can be said on behalf of some of the intuitive reactions people have. One of the, I thought one of the most important examples you give is labor markets. Certainly we can draw supply and demand for labor, wage rate that results if there's competition. Um, but you argue that labor markets are very different in particular uh, you give other examples as well, but labor markets are particularly important to be treated in a different way. Right. So one of the things about an apple market is we don't tend to think that the buying and selling of an apple and the way it's bought and sold has a lot of consequences for the nature of the apple. Um, you know, I can pick an apple, I can buy it from the guy across the street, I can buy it from the organic grocery. An apple is an apple. But the conditions under which labor is bought and sold can have effects on the laborers themselves. So, you know, lots of literature in the, you know, turn of the se this century, but also in, um, among the classical political economists, looked at the effects of certain ways of organizing a labor market on the skill set of the workers themselves. And so if a labor market promotes de-skilling or lack of education, then we have reason to be concerned about that market in a way that we're not concerned about uh, the de-skilling of apples. Or, sure. Um, although if you're Michael Pollan and interested in food, you might worry about the well, way chickens. apples are produced. Maybe chickens, chickens yeah. but, but maybe not apples either. But. <laughs> so, and you give an example, for example, Adam Smith certainly was very aware of this, talked about it a, quite a bit in in uh, The Wealth of Nations, some in the theory of moral sentiments, he's obviously extremely concerned about the large group of people who were laborers in England in his day and the impact of various policies and competitive aspects of markets. Right. So Adam Smith, who's sometimes viewed as a, you know, unquestioning critic, uh, sorry, unquestioning uh, proponent of markets, and an opponent of market regulation actually has a much more sophisticated view. And one of the things you see in, um, in uh, The Wealth of Nations is his concerns about the de-skilling of work mm 
about um, the conditions of work. And at one point he says that in the modern pin factory, um, in effect, you're making workers as much as making pins, and you can be making workers in ways that are not compatible with those workers participating in public life as responsible citizens, and therefore we need the state to intervene, for example, to provide education. Um, Ricardo worried a lot about land markets, mm -hmm. right, and had a view that land was very different than other kinds of commodities. In particular, land's, you know, value doesn't have anything to do with productive contribution. Land, as land grows more scarce, its marginal value goes up, even though the um, entrepreneur may be adding nothing. Sure. And of course, Karl Marx. And of course, Very Karl Marx about it. thought a lot about, in particular, labor markets. You know, when you mentioned Adam Smith, and we've talked a lot about specialization on this program, and, and even literally we've talked about the pin factory more than once, um, I would say the, the cultural condemnation of that, of the power of specialization, comes. The most dramatic example is modern times. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Chaplin's, Charlie Chaplin's film, where a worker who's highly specialized does the same dull, repetitive activity over and over again. It's clearly, certainly for for many people, it would be degrading to be for that to be your best alternative. Maybe not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Some people might like a mindless job, but many people, of course, do not. What, what strikes me is how much the world of specialization, specialization has changed over the last 250 years. You make a number of interesting observations about how class conscious um, Smith and, and certainly Marx obviously were. They, they lived in a time when there was a lot less mobility between classes. And then you think about how Smith didn't really, talk about the pin factory, but that Charlie Chaplin movie would have is is chilling and to, I think anybody mm -hmm. and yet in today's world specialization can often be something really glorious and wonderful you're specialized in ethics uh, doctors specialize in a tiny maybe one disease or a biochemist might specialize in one protein or one process they don't find their life dreary and boring so one view is that some of these phenomenon phenomena and forces are time specific mm -hmm. I'd also want to make a distinction between specialization and de-skilling, uh -huh. so that specialization, as you say, is necessary in a modern, complex world where there's just too much information for anybody to do everything well. But the doctor who specializes in cancer or the philosopher is not um, uh, functioning at the skill level of a non-human machine. Correct. And the Charlie Chaplin movie and the Pin Factory, as Adam Smith paints it, you really have people, in effect, acting as what Marx once referred to as appendages to machines. So there's nothing of their human capacity um, to make and do and be that's being um, called for. And of so, but of course, the irony is is that because of that. So many of those processes, we've taken the human component out. We've substituted so-called smart machines, robots, mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. things, which has the virtue of not having those opportunities available those to, to people to become machines, and the negative, yes. that they don't yes. have that opportunity. Right. So right. that transition is obviously, uh, is obviously a challenge. Now, w one of the things you criticize in the book which I about modern economics, which I wholeheartedly applaud, is your... Uh, I would say, disrespect for efficiency as a decisive argument. So why don't you talk about what your complaints are about efficiency and uh, what you think economists have missed there? Okay. So, I, I mean, I should say, I don't, I'm not a fan of inefficiency. I understand. So. Sure. Neither am <laughs> but, I. <laughs> but I think it's a, it's a more limited notion than we've, um, I think, economists have recognized. And in particular, it's normatively limited. So the first thing is efficiency is always relative to background, some background starting position. So if the background starting position is very unequal, um, an, an outcome can be efficient, but highly morally questionable. So Amartya Sen, I think, gives the example of, you know, imagine a society in which somebody, there are some billionaires and some people who are desperately poor, 
Well, if you take the Paration notion of efficiency, the based on of Pareto, Pareto efficiency, then it's inefficient to transfer any resources from the billionaire to the desperately poor. Um, and that that's true. That would be, you know, so an arrangement that did that. that it would harm someone. Because it would harm, make somebody worse off. Right. And so the, if you think of Pareto, the Pareto idea of efficiency as reaching a point in which nobody can be made better off without somebody being made worse off, we'll start with the billionaire and the very desperately poor person. Suppose the only way to make the desperately poor person better off is to take a dollar from the billionaire. The Pareto efficiency would condemn that as an inefficient arrangement. Yet many people would think in a circumstance like that, a transfer from the billionaire to the desperate, of of course, is um, justified. So it's a narrow notion. Normatively, from a moral point of view, there will be a lot of um, social arrangements that are uh, criticizable, even though they're efficient. So I think saying something is efficient, first of all, it's always efficient with respect to what. Um, and then I also, in, in the book, worry, so one way we talk about an arrangement being inefficient um, is to say, so a, a standard way of thinking of inefficiency is to say um, markets can be inefficient when they generate third-party effects. They can make some third party worse off. And the problem is the notion of externality is actually an under-theorized idea in economics because if you think about it, there are very few transactions that don't make people, somebody worse off. In a complex Agreed. world, Agreed. you build a road, you know, some old business on the, on the older road gets hurt, you build a skyscraper, you block the sun of somebody's apartment, very I few read a book that do, you I that I book, find distasteful. Yeah, which an example you gave, which I always give to my students. I mean, what, what, certainly, does that give me moral grounds that economic grounds for intervene? You know, for you to intervene in my, does that give you economic grounds to intervene in my book choice, my Netflix mm-hmm. queue, my etc. Yeah, right. So if you're thinking about setting social policies, you need more than just the notion of inefficiency and externality in order to think about what to do. And so part of what I want to do is just open up. It's not rejecting or throwing over these notions. It's sort of opening them up and, first of all, saying what kinds of externalities ought we to care about. And, you know, if efficiency isn't the sole value that we ought to think about when we're thinking about markets, what are the other values that are important? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree overwhelmingly with, with almost all that. Um, I, I do think the profession has... Oversold, and for those listening at home, efficiency is a technical piece of economic mm-hmm. jargon. It, it isn't the everyday use of the word that we often think of, like the economy is working well. Uh, they can be correlated, inefficient economies and inefficiency in the jargon sense. But it's usually used in a very specific term and way in, in economics. And the way, one way is what, the way you mentioned, which is the, the Pareto criteria, that it would be inefficient if someone could be made better off without making someone worse off. We'd certainly want that to happen. The other way to think about it is efficiency. The claim is made that an efficient market maximizes net benefits to all involved, Mm -hmm. or uh, a certain intervention would be inefficient because the net gains are smaller than the net losses. And I used to teach that way, incidentally, uh, to my microeconomic students. It's very much part of the Chicago tradition. Mm-hmm. Deadweight loss is the term for these mm-hmm. uh, net losses. And I stopped teaching it, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago for two reasons. One is I didn't find it persuasive as a normative tool. And I think most economists just treat it as open and shut, which is absurd. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the second is... Uh, It's fundamentally utilitarian, and I've increasingly been uncomfortable with utilitarian measures as guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I would defend the terms, the concepts of externality and efficiency as helpful ways to organize your thinking, but certainly not rules or, or absolute guides. And so, for example, in the case of efficiency... To me, the right way to think about efficiency is if a policy is inefficient, it means the pie's not as big as it could be. So what? There, mm-hmm. As you say, many of us would feel overwhelmingly about the justice of a, of a move that made the pie smaller but changed how it was distributed in, in various ways. And I'll, I'll come back and we'll give some mm-hmm. examples 
where we'll see how much we agree on with mm -hmm. you know some of those policies. But I just think I think economists oversell it as sort of a magic um, uh, elixir to, 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 for policy judgments, and I certainly uh, agree with you that it's not. Let Let's take some examples from the book uh, and talk about some some of the critiques you you bring of economics, and more accurately talk about the critiques you make of leaving things to markets and, mm -hmm. and see where where what the arguments are. So one great example that you take, I think, from Thomas Schelling, although he may have gotten it from somewhere else, oh, is the uh, Titanic. The Titanic. Mm -hmm. So talk about the Titanic and and what we learned from that. So um, it is a Schelling example, and I think it's a very thoughtful example. And I, I've thought a lot about it. I don't. I I don't have a you know a fully satisfactory account of what's going on in this example. But Schelling asks us to think about the distribution of um, access to lifeboats on the Titanic. So on the original Titanic, um, you could purchase a seat with access to a lifeboat or a third class seat, which did not come with sufficient lifeboat space um, should anything happen in the boat. Now, of course, People thought the boat was unsinkable and that well, it was a good were just, gamble. They were just decorative huh? anyway. That was the original <laughs> but, thought, um, unfortunately. Of course, it turned out not to be true. And so imagine, not the actual Titanic, but imagine now we know right, that there's a risk involved. Do we want to be a society that builds boats where some of people on the boat will have to go down with the ship while other people will... Um, be able to purchase some level of safety. And one of the things uh, Schelling asks is, do we want to be on that boat, um, in the lifeboat, when somebody else is struggling um, you know, overboard? Some people would find and that an easy question to answer. They'd say yes, but, but would there be some discomfort and, and feeling of, of shame, a feeling of disgust, a feeling of... Um, of horror that your income was right. sufficient to save your life and other people's work. And other people's and, work. And I think you give the modern example, which I think is very appropriate, of uh, if rich people can disproportionately purchase large SUVs and other cars, which tend to be safer and more expensive, mm -hmm. uh, and poor people are buying lightweight cars and more likely to be crushed in an accident, especially with a larger car, how do we feel about that? Mm -hmm. do, is there a role for the state in intervening in those choices, or should we just let people sort and make their own choices? Right. And Schelling says something very interesting in, at the end of this essay. He says, well, you know, maybe given the freedom, you know, somebody wants to buy a ticket, you know, without a lifeboat, maybe we shouldn't prevent them, but maybe they should have to build their own boats. You know, so he imagines maybe we'll have, you know, two boats or two societies, one in which thought, lifeboats are provided for everyone and one in which, you know, some people sail off without um, security. And I, the, the other example that came to mind, and, and by the way, you know, we're not going to have time to go into all the, the details, but you do a, a, a superb job in giving all the standard economist arguments, most of them. I'm going to okay. raise a couple I think you missed, but, but most of the arguments you make are made very well on the other side, the, you know, the, the idea that people should be free to make their own choices, mm -hmm. the idea that people uh, should be informed, and if they choose when informed to make uh, mm -hmm. to not buy the safer thing, that uh, the argument that well maybe you should give people cash, mm -hmm. they're the best judge of whether to buy the safety or not, and so give them the cash if they then choose to buy the less safe seat because they'd rather have the money for something else, should you respect that? You go through all the, most of what I consider the, the standard arguments in economics, and you do a very interesting job disagreeing with them. Mm -hmm. So you, you go through all those. But I want to take a modern, even better example maybe than the cars, which is airline safety. Mm -hmm. So right now we have a system where the government has decreed that we're all equally safe, or unsafe as the case may be. We're forced to go through this um, TSA process, if we want to go on an airplane, we're free not to go on an airplane. But if we want to go, we have to go through this process. As a classical liberal, my preference would be that airlines should be free to choose for themselves, mm -hmm. and customers can then sort accordingly. So some airlines might choose one level of safety. Some airlines might 
with, with all kinds of mm-hmm. scanning, some, mm-hmm. including intrusive scanning we, mm-hmm. that you might choose not to be part of. Others might just pass out guns to everybody mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or box cutters uh-huh. to everyone. You mm-hmm. know, we can imagine a wide range of choices. There's, so one argument is let those choices work. If you get on that plane, that's true in the shelling sense. Mm-hmm. You're not on a plane where half the people have parachutes right, and right, half the people right. don't. Mm-hmm. But there's choices between planes in terms of expected outcomes and safety. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's a bad idea? Does that make you uncomfortable? So that's, the, I mean, that is the shelling idea of the separate, like, right, let people correct. have their, um, I, you know, in, in theory, I don't think it's a bad idea in part because I also share the, um, the you know, uh, your uh, value of choice and enabling a yep. wide range of choices. Which are very do, respectful again in the book. I do worry about um, if you make some choices available to people that are actually really harmful, you'll wind up in situations where people sometimes feel more compelled to make those choices. So imagine, okay, you made the boats and you can go on either boat, but some people are really poor in the society. Sure. And so it's going to be a lot of more, in, you know, kind of pull for them to take those boats. Um, so you might wind up unraveling a little bit of the safety net um, that you thought you provided by giving the other option. So the, right, because the, the economic pressure is going to be very powerful, and you're going to get crashes and mm-hmm. uh, bad outcomes that are going to be very depressing to the third party, the, mm-hmm. those of us on the outside who weren't involved in the choice, which is going to motivate us, I think, to, to influence that choice, right? Right, and there'll be other issues like, should people be able to take their children on any kind of sure. plane that they want? Mm-hmm. And so there are other kinds of concerns that could be raised. But I think in general, if you could really arrange the world so we could have a lot of different experiments going on and we had competent adults, you know, making various kinds of choices and there was no interaction effects, I have no, theoretically, no problem. It's just that I worry that there'll be all kinds of interaction effects. And So let me raise, let me raise a, a, a bigger uh, criticism of, of your approach, mm-hmm. uh, a more general criticism, which is... Uh, in any of these cases where, and let's just take the simplest example, where there is discomfort by third parties about the transaction, whether it's uh, high prices for a particular product after a natural disaster, child labor, you give a whole range of things that, that we find uh, discomforting as, as, as bystanders, not, mm-hmm. not as transactors. Um, clearly, we, we both understand and agree that there are a lot of voluntary, voluntary transactions where both parties want to make the transaction, and we know that a lot of people would want to stop that transaction who are not mm-hmm. party to it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I want to, want to focus on. Uh, and I would mention we, we recently had a podcast with Mike Munger on, on vo- whether voluntary exchanges are actually voluntary, and we'll, of course, put a link up to that. So my question is this. So you point out, I think 100% correctly, that a lot of people are, are discomforted by these transactions, which gives a justification for state intervention under certain circumstances. Do you have a theory of the state to go alongside with that? So we, we, have, mm-hmm. we have markets which don't work the way they work in textbooks, and I think good economists are aware of that. Bad ones, or many of whom are problematic, are a problem, and they're in your, your book in various ways. Uh, you know, they, they hew to a very sterile line of efficiency. But I think a thoughtful economist says, oh, markets don't always work so well. We know governments don't work so well either. So talk about what effect that has, if at all, on your normative views. Um, so I do say in the book that um, always when you're assessing an institution, you need to assess it against alternatives. So you might think an institution doesn't work that well, a market doesn't work that well, but then the obvious question to ask is, okay, what are the alternatives and do they work better? And you want to think broadly about that. You want to be open to, well, maybe you have to rethink a lot of the institutions, but you still have to think about what are the possible alternatives. If there's no possible alternative that's better, then I think we are stuck with the not-so-good alternative yep. we have. And one of the things I talk about in the book is sometimes 
you have a problematic market and you are tempted to close it down because it's an awful market. So child labor would be an example. But the, supposing you're in a society where the only alternative is to close it down and have a black market where the lives of children are far worse. Yeah. Well, then I think that's relevant to the question of what you should do. It doesn't change the assessment that the child labor market is problematic, but it does lead you to think, well, I don't have a viable alternative here. In some cases, government is too weak to close down, you know, to shut down a black market. So often. In the, yeah, often. In the United States, we do a pretty good job. You know, so child labor is not On a widespread labor. practice in the United States. Yeah, I think there's not much demand for it. Where there's a lot of demand, like for cocaine, we don't do yeah, such a good job. That's true. <laughs> well, drugs is a, good, yeah. is a good case, and that may lead, you know, somebody to think there's an argument for deregulation of yeah. drugs, period, because the um, closing down the... Um, making it illegal hasn't shut down Correct. the flourishing practice. I wanted to get back to one thing you said, though. So my view isn't that the moral distaste people have gives grounds for government intervention. They're, so, I mean, that's what I worry about externality is too broad. Good point. Because I don't want it just yeah. to be the fact that people disagree. Correct me, It's yeah. got to be the fact that people are actually harmed. There's and an then injustice. we need some conception of what a harm is. So in the child labor case, what I'm interested in is, so if you allow a practice of child labor, and let's say you have the view willing buyer, willing seller, there is a third party cost because a widespread practice of child labor changes the price of adult labor and therefore makes it harder for families who don't want to put their children to work to not, I mean, to be able to do that. And so they pay a cost. Mm -hmm. And... So that's the, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about um, harms, and then of course you need a big, a theory of harm, but a theory of harm that's different than a theory of, you know, as Mill said, the mere likings and dislikings of a majority shouldn't be a law to individuals. It's not the fact that people disapprove, it's the fact that their well-being or agency is actually damaged. So I want to come back to the harm issue, but I, I want to mm -hmm. raise one other question related to the power of the state. So you mentioned the possibility the state might be too weak, can't really shut down a market effectively, or we could argue, I suppose. Or the state is bureaucratically inept and, you know. Um, Correct. Right. How about it's not um, just inept, but it's um, manipulated? So mm -hmm. to take the airport security example, the people who make these very complicated scanners, which I don't believe do anything to make me safer, it's an empirical question, mm -hmm. but... They certainly, there's a certain unattractive aspect to it, which is that the people who make the scanners make large contributions to politicians, and so we can get outcomes that aren't effective at all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, here I'm, I think it, what the facts are. So, as I said, you need a, a, you know, an assessment about the institutions, the capacities of the institutions. I tend to be less pessimistic about the capacities of the state than some of my libertarian sure. friends are. No doubt. But it's an empirical yeah. question as to whether or not um, having state regulation has better outcomes along the dimensions, the moral dimensions you care about, than not a having intervention. And I think you have to look at it case by case. So let's go back to your, I want to come back to the harm issue. You, you give... I think four mm -hmm. examples of what you call four characteristics that can lead to a noxious market, meaning a market that that we might, on j grounds of justice and ethics, not allow transactions to take place freely uh, in, in a in the way that that's traditionally defined. What are some of those characteristics that you that you would mention? So you know, going back to the idea that markets are heterogeneous, and they're not all the same. I um, uh, identify four. Um, parameters that I think the noxious markets share to some extent or another. And um, I, I, to paraphrase a line from Tolstoy, uh, not all noxious markets are the same. All, all, you know, happy markets are the same, <laughs> but all noxious markets are different. So, and some. Uh, right. Uh, no, it's first the Kreutzers. Oh, you know, it's Anna Karenina. The first, yeah. Maybe the first line. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Um, so some markets have what I call weak agency. So 
you can think about that as either low levels of information or actually low levels of um, authorial, you know, uh, of authorship of the market. So you think about child labor markets, well, children are parties in some sense to the exchange, but they're not authors of the exchange. Other people are transacting for them. Mm -hmm. um, dictators on the international market uh, contracting debt. Mm -hmm. So these are markets that have weak agency, and so I think that's a flag. And the weaker the agency, the more the market, in my view, tips to be a noxious market. And I try to give a bunch of examples of weak agency. Um, child labor is one clear one. You know, maybe, you know, if you think about the housing bubble and, you know, how much people really understood about who were getting into subprime loans, you might think there were real information failures there. A lot of people were spending other people's money, which is right. one which example is another, of where this yes. arises and why that happens. An interesting debate. We're going to put that aside, but yeah, it's an interesting example. So that's one uh, dimension. Another dimension is harm. So some markets are harmful, either for the agents themselves, usually that goes along with their having weak agency, they don't really understand what they're contracting about, or uh, has harm for third parties. So again, the child labor case, you harm uh, families who don't want their children, the children of uh, families who want to educate their children but now can't because they can't afford not to put their children to work. Um, you know, pollution is a standard case of a sure. third-party harm. So some markets, I say, generate um, sufficient individual harms that they, you know, push the market into a noxious category. I also have a category of social harm. So I say some markets are really problematic from the point of view of a democracy. And now we get into more complicated and debatable, like, well, what should we think about campaign finance? Or, you know, what are the alternatives? And how does it work? And there are many, many complexities. But you might worry about, um, uh, you know, media being simply up for sale in terms of what, what does it do to the <coughs> possibility of democratic discussion and wide range of opinions. An empirical question, but so on my view, you have to look at sometimes for the social fabric. So child labor is not only bad for children, it's bad for the kind of society that you generate when you have widespread child labor, which is this, an illiterate population. And this argument's been made in various ways on the minimum wage law that, mm -hmm. that you know, I'm Maybe we'll just come back to that. We'll come back to minimum wage. I think okay. it's a nice example. Brings up a bunch of other stuff. Carry on. Okay. You need a fourth category. And the fourth category is, you know, it's a form of inequality, but it's really about um, extreme vulnerability. So one other feature of markets is that um, agents can come to market with very different amounts of resources, and. I argue that in some cases, the differences in the amount of resources agents bring leave some people in effect with no ability to enter an exit or sanction. And so the people then in that market accept terms that nobody with a decent alternative would ever accept. Maybe and it's this, similar to the price gouge. Yeah, and this is related to, to Mike Munger's work on what he calls U-voluntary exchanges, truly voluntary exchanges. So. He brings in the concept of um, the best alternative to no agreement, a BATNA, the ATNA, the best mm -hmm. alternative to no agreement, meaning if, if there's an enormous difference in what I have at stake in the transaction versus what you have at stake, gives the example someone's in the desert. Mm -hmm. uh, it's similar to the Titanic example in a way, and that it's a dramatic, it's not a small difference, it's a big difference. Somebody's starving, excuse me, thirsty, mm -hmm. you have water, you're healthy and fine, you charge the person every single penny that they have with them and, and their heirs and everything else, and they thrillingly pay it. Uh, if it doesn't happen, they're dead. If mm -hmm. you don't get that, you make a little less money that month. It's a mm -hmm. radically different um, set of circumstances each person's facing. Now, the implications of that, I think, are interesting. We'll talk maybe about price gouging and, and minimum wage, but certainly that's a dramatic example uh, of vulnerability, of vulnerability, similar to your point. Uh, so, so let's take some examples. Um, and I try again, try to bring in some other some other issues. Let's start with price gouging. Mm -hmm. Where does that fit on your in your um, taxonomy? So I think so-called so-called so, price gouging. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I think that there are going to be some circumstances in which, again, you know, there's, again, the question, what are the alternative institutions, but where, you know, take um, uh, fire sales in, you know, after droughts in third world countries, where we just feel like there's some, somebody is being taken unfair advantage of, and that um, the market isn't, in this sense, you know, really um, uh, improving the prospects of a, I mean, it, it's, it, it, cross gouging is a little bit like a de facto monopoly. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think that monopoly is, you know, supposed to be the counter of, you know, markets are freedom and monopoly is the state of unfreedom because there's really only one transactor, there are a lot of cases of markets that start to look more like monopoly. Um, and so on the scale of, you know, not all monopolies, I mean, there are a lot of monopolies you can walk away from. Sure. So this is where the extreme vulnerability comes in, like the person who's um, faced with uh, a desert where one person owns all the water. And this is actually an example that Robert Nozick worries about in Anarchy State and Utopia, where he, you know, wants to say, even on his extreme libertarian theory, there's got to be a limit to what the person who owns all the water can do, right? There's, and he thinks that he finds that limit in a return to the Lockean proviso, and there's a question whether he can really help himself to the Lockean proviso. Talk about what that is, the Lockean proviso. The Lockean proviso, proviso is the idea in Locke um, that you can um, uh, obtain as much property right as, let's say, are, is the product of your initiative and entrepreneurial skill, um, as is compatible with leaving enough and as good for others. So you can appropriate land, you can appropriate water, only up to the point when enough and as good is left for others. And for Locke, the origin of that is in a religious view where he thinks God has given the earth in common to man to use and that sets a limit on how much any individual can appropriate. So there's a norm, this norm of sort of pre-appropriation rights to the world for all living things, and that sets a, a limit on what you can do to other people. So you can't gouge, you know, you can't be a monopolist in such a way as you make the position of people worse off than it would have been had there been no ownership. So and so let, let's get into the, um, I really think of these as sort of the flip side, uh, price gouging and, and the minimum wage. They're, they're both phenomena where the price that's produced by freedom, by free exchange, it has some unappealing characteristics. Um, and as you argue, I think correctly, certainly you have to look at the alternatives. So the standard way that I think is the most attractive case you can make We've put a simple, we haven't gone on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in general. We've said, we've put ceilings or floors in. Mm -hmm. We've said, and they're nice examples because in the case of the, of the so-called price gouging, it's a short-term problem. Mm -hmm. It's a temporary problem. It's induced typically by a, a catastrophe of some kind, another a flood, a hurricane, a tornado, whatever. The minimum wage is a long-term problem. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a price that persists. And, mm -hmm. and, and let's take your monopoly example. Certainly, uh, if I have low skill, I can have lots of competitive alternatives for my uh, talents, but they're all crummy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, so in that sense, it mimics mm -hmm. a monopoly mm -hmm. outcome. And similarly, with, with uh, say, clean water after a, a disaster, or fresh water or ice mm -hmm. after a, a power outage due to a disaster, there might be a lot of people selling ice, but it's so few relative to the demand that the price is something something akin to mm -hmm. a monopoly price. So, so it's a dramatic. They're both dramatic examples. I think are hard for uh, classical liberals or libertarians to defend. And the the, the other version of this is, and you, you bring this up in the book, uh, somebody who can't afford health care, which is an example again. So if you can't afford apples. Mm -hmm. We'd say, well, life's tough, but it's not a tragedy. If you can't afford health care, it's a tragedy. So in all these cases, what I think is missing from the critique of markets, I think there's two things that are missing, and I want your reaction. One is the dynamic aspect of mm -hmm. it. 
So for example, if I put a price ceiling on ice after a hurricane, and the Attorney General's, it's not done at the national level much anymore, but it's done a lot at the state level. They ban unfair prices. I discourage the provision of ice. You're well aware of this, obviously, mm -hmm. and, and it's what's, again, what I like about your book is that you're open to the, I think, good economics. So obviously we're going to hurt the people uh, who, who might want the ice are now going to get none. They're mm -hmm. not going to have the freedom to transact. Similar argument can be made in the case of kidney sales. You recognize the fact that if we, it's an empirical question, mm -hmm. as you point out, but let's say it is the case that banning kidney sales means more people are going to die. Uh, and in the case of the minimum wage, the economist's argument is, again, I think the correct argument, not, there's a lot of other arguments mm -hmm. I, I, that I abhor, but abhor, but the correct argument is you're going to hurt the people you're trying to help. What's your reaction to that, uh, those incentive effects that get, get put into motion in those situations? Are you willing, do you I understand you recognize them, but you don't often do not find them decisive in your calculus. Why not, and, or am I missing something? Um, I think, so I'm not an empirical social scientist, and I'm open to, I mean, I actually, I agree with you. I think the dynamic effects are really, Key. Um, you know, child labor is an interesting case because I think there may be situations in which child labor, is, there isn't any other alternative. You know, you ban child labor, you don't get, um, you know, some effect of, uh, you know, more adult investment wages, yeah, into yeah. adult labor. The adult labor is not enough to sustain the family. It's not productive enough, and you have worse outcomes. Yeah. And I think in those cases, we have to be open to think about, okay, transitional um, measures that might ultimately lead us down the path we want, but we can't get there by simply um, banning a market. So I think the dynamic effects are really important. I'm just less... Uh, I don't find the idea that some, you know, sometimes people say, well, this is the best we can do. Um, I'm not convinced, because I'm not convinced we've ever really tried all the alternatives. So even to take the example of organs, and you know, organs is a hard case, and I don't yeah. have a, um, a clear view myself on um, whether or not organ markets are you know, permissible, and if so, under what circumstances. But I don't think on the alternative, you know, we've done enough to try to increase donation. Um, and there are a lot of different things we could do. You know, one of the obvious is change the default. Um, and so right now you have to put a pink dot on your license to say you're going to be an organ donor. Do the opposite. Make the default everybody is an organ donor, and you have to put a pink dot if you don't want to be an organ donor. Mm -hmm. Now, opt that, out rather right, than opt in. out rather than, and that won't solve the problem, but it will probably make some modest increase. We could have campaigns. Stanford always has, um, we now have a battle that goes on with Berkeley over who can give the most blood. Uh -huh. um, and it's amazing I what that imagine. does. <laughs> and uh -huh. so, you know, I think there's a lot more we could do, you know, with, the, you know, technologies to, you know, induce, give incentives to donate. So I think there's more we can do. Non-monetary incentives. Non-monetary yeah. incentives. But if it turned out, that there's nothing we can do, you know, sometimes there are really tragic circumstances, then, you know, all bets are off as to what the right, you know, the best institution is in the context where you can't ever really solve the problem. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with you that, that um, uh, let, let me say it a little different than I was going to say it. It's certainly true that when you go to a market solution, you lose some of the innovation that might have come forth mm -hmm. uh, otherwise. Of course, the reverse is true. Uh, and I also find, which I want to talk about in a minute, but what I also find fascinating is we try hard. Sometimes it still fails, but people don't accept that empirical case. Now, it could be it's still not a good empirical case. Example I would use is education. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to get the state out of the education market. Mm -hmm. You make a number of defenses of public education of various kinds mm -hmm. throughout the book. Um, you know, the standard, I think, defense of public education is we haven't tried hard enough. I think we've tried for 40 years. We've spent 
an enormous amount of money, greater than we did 40 years ago. It's failed. Mm -hmm. We're condemning kids in the inner cities and elsewhere to bitter and horrible lives that are grossly unfair and unjust. And isn't the burden of proof on 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 the proponents now to say, you know, let's mm -hmm. this isn't working I, to prove why it's working? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so educate. You know, of course, there's a lot of empirical. So I I think actually education has worked relatively well, except, as you say, for the you know, least advantaged. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at, you know, standard education for middle class kids, state actually does a pretty good job. You can be surprisingly good even, yeah. It's true. Right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and that's a lot of kids. <laughs> so, true. and it's, I mean, it's a huge, it's one of the, you know, the big public goods the state provides, and by and large it does it relatively well. Now, there are circumstances in which it doesn't function well, and then the question is why. And, I, you know, it's a, lots of empirical things here. My own view is a lot of the fix for the education problem has to be outside education and doesn't have anything to do no with doubt. schools. And no doubt. I, although, I, you know, I, it's clearly a big part of the problem. The other part, I think, is uh, my bias mm -hmm. is that the places that do well, the parents have alternatives. The places that don't do well, the parents don't have alternatives. So th there's an incentive effect working within the public system. But maybe. But yeah. uh, easy to say. Right, right, <laughs> hard right. To prove. Uh, hard to even confirm or, or try to get evidence on. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is... But education is a case where we do think, you know, it's a little bit like the minimum wage. We think there's some minimum level, whether it's the state that should provide it or some other entity... There's something that everyone is entitled to, you know, that we ought to protect. If, if we don't think the market by itself should supply this, because if there were market failure, we wouldn't be happy with some kids not going to school because their parents couldn't afford to educate them. Right. And so for me, that's an empirical question. I'm much happier with that outcome than a world where people do go to school and don't learn anything for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, can we do right. better about can that? We right. Can we improve that? And obviously, mm -hmm. we could. We don't seem mm -hmm. to make enough progress there. The other issue I want to raise is this, um, which fascinates me, and I, I, because it's so hard to, to think about in any analytical way. You, you give a number of examples in, in the book where there are aspects to the a market solution that are unattractive because, and I, it's hard for me to put it into words, maybe you'll have a shot at it, and mm -hmm. then I'll get to my question, mm -hmm. There's something about the textural life that mm -hmm. results from having a commercial transaction that's the things we don't like about it. We, mm -hmm. we all understand, we, you know, it, we've given a lot of examples on this program of you, know, you don't go to a friend's house and say, well, you know, I couldn't stop for a bottle of, of wine, so here's $20. Mm -hmm. buy, one, mm -hmm. buy one you'll really like. Uh -huh. It's even better than giving them the bottle uh -huh. you would have chosen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, mm -hmm. no one thinks that's a good idea except the worst economist. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there were things about, Commercial transactions um, that that the the change that can't be measured as tangibly mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. prices and quantities, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the main uh, I think advantages of your book in bringing that out. But there's similarly those things on the government provision side. So, for example, if I have you give the example of someone who who's, doesn't have health care, doesn't mm -hmm. have health insurance, or worse, doesn't have health care, so poor, so destitute, so. Yes, there's an argument for the state intervening. But if the state intervenes, state intervention produces a certain quality of experience for that person. It can be very different than the quality they'd have in a charitable solution. Now, you can debate about whether mm -hmm, the magnitudes mm -hmm. would be as big. Mm -hmm. But when I think about, as a taxpayer, what I'm doing for poor people through health programs, and I think about how the actual bureaucracy works, and it's not as, as, as glorious and and ennobling as, as we might think about in theory. And I compare that to a world where individuals are motivated to help their, their fellow human beings. We lose something when we go to that bureaucratic coercive world. And I find that people who don't like markets often don't recognize that. Do you agree with that that's an issue? Is it important? Um, so I'm less uh, fond of the charitable solution mm -hmm. Mostly because I actually think there's a demeaning relationship okay. between the recipient and the uh, a, a donor in a charity case. Because the recipient is dependent 
you know, in the same way you might worry about government creating dependency, there's another kind of dependency here um, of somebody's largesse. Absolutely. And that creates a texture of a relationship between people um, that is, you know, uh, you know, you want people to look each other in the eye. You mm -hmm. don't want them to grovel, you know, or to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, have to doff their hat. Um, and so I worry about that kind of relationship. In some sense, the impersonality of government takes that away. Yeah. Right. And especially if you think it's an entitlement, not a, you know, you're not dependent on somebody's largesse. We as a society have decided, right, that all of our members are going to get certain benefits. Um, and have access to certain benefits, what, you know, whatever their position or condition is in society. Now, I think we have to worry about, and so this is where the texture comes in, we do have to worry about long-term incentive effects, and we don't want a bunch, you know, create a bunch of people who are free riders. We want people to have an ethos where they you know, see that this is a co-responsibility for all of us, um, and you have to worry about that. But I'm not as... Um, a big a fan of the charity solution as getting the virtues that you want of, I mean, you get some, I agree. You know, there's something about the altru, you know, the opportunities for altruism. Well, it's mainly for the donor. Right, but, then but not relative, for the... Well, it depends. I think, right. you know, that's why Maimonides, great 13th century Jewish mm, yeah. philosopher said, the highest level of charity is when both sides are anonymous. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I'm giving to. Yeah. I don't know who I'm receiving from. Um, and this was Titmus's thing about blood, right? That blood was the, you know, in the gift relationship, blood was the ultimate um, form of charity because the recipients were anonymous and the donors are anonymous. It's interesting. In, in the current world, we allow, I don't know if this is true or not, maybe you know, if I, if I want to donate a kidney, of course, kidney is a great example, mm -hmm. as is blood, because you can donate it and keep living. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Uh, although in the case of the kidney, you've raised your chance of a little bit of, of, of dying because it's inherently a little bit dangerous uh -huh. and you only have one kidney left. But uh, I think in a kidney case, you can give to a stranger, but of course you're going to get to know that person and it, it leads to a lot, the way it's currently set up, it leads to some very tough emotional yeah. um, and some people actually Ethical don't issues. want to, um, some people actually don't want to know the person. So you can request anonymity. Uh -huh. And then of on course, both on both sides, but a lot of people, you know, some people don't want the anonymity, some people do, sometimes you get a, person, right? They, uh, or they want to browbeat the person for how much they owe them to, for say, <laughs> right, you know, it's, right. it's a tough... It, which is a very, yeah. and there is something about the anonymous giving that, I mean, you can see why Maimonides thought that this is the ultimate, because then there is no possibility of, you know, uh, tit for tat or right. groveling or, I mean, it's in its purest form. Yeah. The, uh, a, a friend of mine who became a, a uh, CFO for a foundation when he mm -hmm. got the job, his friends, another friend said, uh, congratulations, you'll never eat. Uh, you'll never pay for dinner again, and you'll never get an, an honest compliment because, of uh, course, when yeah, you're handing yeah. out large sums of money, people right. like you more. At least they're going to mm -hmm. pretend they like you more. Mm -hmm. There's something degrading about that, obviously. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I actually had an interesting experience this year because one of my students has decided to be an organ donor, mm -hmm. and um, and I, you know, and I have a 12 year old, and I've been thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about this for myself too, because there are risks involved, but of course, we can live with one kidney, and particularly in the developed world, and if you're lucky enough to have access to healthcare, it really does raise an issue about, you know, why isn't this done more, and, um, and what are our responsibilities, and is, isn't this a, you know, a kind of form of beneficence that, um, ought to be encouraged. And when the student came to talk to me, I was, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> you know, so it was a place where I found my own, intu you know, sort of intuitive pull was opposed to what my, you know, what I think is probably the ethically right thing to do. Yeah. I, and 
And that's a case where you always worry. I mean, my argument, like many uh, arguments in, in these realms, does appeal to intuitions. And you always have to worry when you're appealing to intuitions. You know, what is the status of these intuitions? And, you know, there are a lot of intuitions we're probably better off if we could push away. And, you know, on the other hand, I don't think we can bypass them. Well, they come um, from a deep place, and we often invoke F.A. Hayek on this program, and he was a deep respecter of those norms mm -hmm. and, and intuitions that had evolved over time right, and culturally. Right. And, and even though we might not understand them, they have a certain merit for mm -hmm. that reason. Uh, it's interesting because I have a friend who's a social worker, and she uh, counsels uh, organ donors. And um, I think their default is to discourage them initially mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. on the grounds that there's often regret, complications, problems. Uh, the initial enthusiasm passes, and there's you know the issues you talk about a lot in the book: issues of perfect information, knowledge, and, and agency, uh, vulnerability. But um, I think our default should be to applaud it uh, mm -hmm. rather than as some yeah. people view it as as a as a, as a, as a form of pathology mm -hmm. to make it because too generous. Yeah. Right, it, it's right. such a generous gesture. Mm -hmm. It suggests something must be terribly wrong. Um, I think we should probably probably applaud it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so too. But I, I find myself strangely <laughs> resistant to doing what I think is right. <laughs> That's the academic in you. <laughs> it's the contrary in all, in all academics. Um, let, let's close with a discussion of an example you have in there that I found haven't thought about in a long, long time, but it's sort of a classic example, which is uh, we don't allow market in votes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, my view on this, very similar uh, to, the, to my problems with efficiency as a, as a, as a norm or as some kind of decisive thing, I, you know, there's a lot of ethical issues that I think we all would agree um, that I, I really don't care about the efficiency. Mm -hmm. I think there should be a principle that I'm free to read what I want. And the fact that it harms you and maybe mm -hmm. harms you, you'd be willing to pay more than I'm, well, you could buy, obviously you could pay me to stop reading it, mm -hmm. uh, but if there's, collective action problems, there's free riding problems, so you can't raise the money, so we just, you just ban those books mm -hmm. because the net gain is supposedly greater than the net loss. I think that's, that's just evil. I think that we should have mm -hmm. a moral imperative. Uh, and similarly, I, I have no problem arguing that it's wrong to sell votes. It's just mm -hmm. unethical. But the more I thought about it, I started thinking, why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it is, it is um, I think, our natural thought, come back to retreat, mm -hmm. well, of course it's wrong to sell a vote. But then I started... You know, I'm not, I'm not so comfortable with it. I'm not so sure. Part of it's my bias as a classical liberal, mm -hmm. but and my ideological emphasis. But what's wrong with selling votes? Right. You know, so um, I think it's a great question to think about because it seems so obvious and it's not yeah. so easy to give an explanation. So, you know, one, one reason somebody might think right away is, look, the whole point of giving people votes you know, in a democracy is to move away from an aristocracy where the decisions are made by the rich and the powerful. And if you have an unequal society and you allow market and votes, poor people will, dis in theory, more likely to sell their votes. And so, in effect, you're moving back to a system where wealth is um, uh, uh, predicts political influence and power. And that's an anti-democratic idea that's an aristocratic idea. So I think that's part of, I don't think it's the full explanation because I think you could imagine, think about a world in which we redistribute income and then ask, now Would do you we want to market in votes? And, and you give the James right. Tobin quote, it's famous yeah. quote, uh, at least it was when I was in grad school, mm -hmm. that a good second year grad student can prove it's efficient to let people sell votes on the obvious grounds that both parties are better off. What's the, what's the problem? Right, right, right. And so, but I do think one, you know, one way to think about it is that votes aren't your own individual property. They're really, you know, we, the people, you know, are just deliberating and deciding what to do for us. And when you treat your vote like it's just a private good, you're, in some sense, Changing, I mean, so this would be a kind of Walzerian uh, view about the meaning of what, you know, what it means to have a vote and what voting is as a practice. And about Michael Walzer. Michael yeah. Walzer, so this idea that, you know, it's really about co deliberation among equals. 
And it's not about you know, private preferences. It's about we're trying to figure out what we should do as a country right? in, the, in the, the case of national election. What's good for us? What's in our good? And once you take the vote out and make it a market good, then it's not really about what should we all do. It's about, well, what do I want? You know, I don't care about this thing, so you take it. Yeah, the, the, the funny part about it, the reason I like the argument, the issue being raised and why it made me think is that I'm a person who's not particularly sympathetic to democracy as a decision-making process, mm -hmm. which is why, part of the reason that I'm a libertarian. Mm -hmm. But even I mm -hmm. am sort of repulsed by the idea of selling votes, and then I start thinking about it because I'm susceptible to this romance Mm -hmm. that the current system has this egalitarian aspect that we all get one vote. But you gave the example that if we sold votes, then maybe the rich would have a lot of political power. They already have an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. Both the left and the right mm -hmm. are particularly worried about it right now with the mm -hmm. bank bailouts and the, and the, the way that the, the country's going. It's ironic, right, mm -hmm. that, that we have this credible intuition, which I think is misplaced, about the sanctity of the vote, because although I like democracy rather than dictatorship, what are the alternatives, right? But the, our current democracy, I don't like so much, and I would rather see more things put into the sphere of, of decentralized decision making rather than top down. So I found it to be a, a very provocative example. It is a great example. I, I, I often start um, and when I teach this stuff with the vote because the students immediately say, of course not, and then find that they quickly run out of arguments <laughs> as to why not. So, My guest today has been Deborah Satz. Deborah, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.